What is Dune? You might have heard of it recently with the success of the 2021 part one film and part two coming out this year. It is most famously a book and books, a movie from the 80s, a TV miniseries, and a sequel. There's even a board game and an upcoming open world survival MMO. After watching the 2021 film, I became really addicted to wanting to know more. So I read the source material. I read the very first book. And after that, I kept talking about it with friends, family, and colleagues. And a lot of them really curious as to what the plot is, to which I tried to explain it and Every single time I explain it, more questions would come up, which would follow more questions. I couldn't tell them about Arrakis without telling them about Spice. And them asking what Spice is, I have to talk about the Spacing Guild. I have to talk about the Spacing Guild, I have to talk about Chome, and the Imperium, and then the Harkonnens and the Atreides, and it just, it just all falls apart. I did not know how complex Dune actually was, even after the movie. If you clicked on this video, you're probably interested in how complex it is. Is it really as complicated as I'm making it out to be? You probably sitting at home are wondering, it can't actually be that complex. Well, I can't just casually say to you that it's about a teenage heir to a planetary duke who relocates to a desert planet where they mine oil for space travel and are under danger as opposing houses fight to regain their planet and its wealthy resource, all the while experiencing vivid dreams of the future, human consciousness and the weight of choices amongst the story, plus space witches and sandworms. Not a casual lullbreaker. Having finished the first and main installment of Dune and getting into the sequels, I wanted to make a video to express how much I loved the story, but also try and see if I can distill the complexity of the story, its basic premise, and all the other baggage that comes with the terminology into a very succinct portion of this video. So if you wanted to hear my personal thoughts about the stories and all the spoilers and all the things I really loved, just go to this time here. But if you want to have an understanding to maybe try your hand at a new sci-fi epic, sit and let me tell you what I know. Before I begin, you have to understand that Dune is a complex book. It wasn't clickbait. It's very much lost on people who even just watched the 2021 film. As unpretentious as I can say it, it's kind of a big brain book. Not just because of the themes of consciousness, religion, politics, traditions, fate, free will, man versus nature, you know, the combo, but also the terminology. It is hard to keep track of sometimes. There are so many phrases, titles, places, mythos, items, words, that it can be too much. So as I name them, don't feel too worried that you don't fully understand. Because let's be honest, no one actually fully understands. Only Frankie does. And honestly, that's why there is a terminology in the book to consult when you read across a word you don't understand. Even when the David Lynch 80s movie adaptation released, people were given a terminology pamphlet to avoid confusion upon buying a ticket. I wish I was kidding. Dune also has a very big reputation in science fiction literature. It was written in the 60s by Frank the Chad Herbert. The novel has an ability to still be interpreted and understood through genre norms still to this day. It is aged better than most YA novels. Now, if you think that comment was bias, it's because it was. On the back of a regular paperback version, you will find it says, before The Matrix, before Star Wars, before Ender's Game and Neuromancer, there was Dune. Many say it did for sci-fi what Tolkien did for fantasy, the genre, and literature itself. Many call it even the greatest sci-fi novel ever written. I have not read enough sci-fi novels to say that, but let's say it is for me. But enough with the hype. What is it even about? I'm going to be giving a brief summary and some minor spoilers as to the first couple chapters and the first couple scenes of the movie and book. Essentially, the year is 10,191. Humanity has colonized the stars and are ruled by the Pradisha Emperor Shaddam IV. Through his Imperium are other great houses who rule over one or many planets, kind of like the houses of Game of Thrones. And they are all a part of what's called the Landsrad. Basically, it's a parliament to counterbalance the dictatorship of the Imperium, and the Imperium is put in place to rule over Landsrad decisions. At the beginning of the book, the Emperor has ordered for the Honorable House Atreides to take over rule of the desert planet Arrakis, also known as Dune. Hey, wow, cool. Name of the book. Let's move on. Now, the original rulers of Arrakis were the brutal House Harkonnen, mortal enemies to the Atreides. By taking away their planet and its wealthy riches, the Emperor has set the board for the two houses to engage in warfare. The reason is because the Emperor is jealous of the love that the Duke Leto of House Atreides gets from the other great houses. And so, in order to silently get rid of House Atreides, he sets the stage for war. Now, the reason why this planet means so much is because despite Arrakis being a bunch of empty sand dunes, and is as hot as an Australian Christmas right now is because it is home to the powerful commodity Melange, more commonly known as Spice. 
Spices used by the natives of Arrakis and other factions in the universe to extend life and bring health benefits as they consume a diet of it. Becoming addicted involves constantly consuming it lest the user dies of spice withdrawal. Other symptoms include the subject getting these very distinct blue eyes that come with a lot of spice addiction. The more you hear about spice and the more important it becomes is kind of crazy because ultimately if you have it too much you will die from it. So it kind of sounds like a really bad infomercial. <laughs> hey, are you down on your luck? Do you have that intestinal virus you can't seem to get rid of? Why don't you try and spice up your life for you and your family? Come down to Arrakis and get a barrel of spice. There are no consequences, except possible death. You get some cool blue eyes, and guess what, boys? You'll be living a 20 years longer. It's basically the heroin, but with only the benefits. But despite the life benefits, the real reason spice is so valuable is because of the Spacing Guild. The Spacing Guild is an institute that have monopolized space travel because they know how to do it so well with the use of spice. How they do it is hard to describe. They have been said that they can fold space itself with the powers of spice it gives them and see through time so that they can get safe passage from one planet to the next. Without spice as a hallucinogen for the Spacing Guild, space travel is impossible. So it's kind of important. Think of it as our oil or our electricity or our internet, our content. If we don't have it, we starve and we die. Now with that over, we can get to our main character. Jesus Christ, we haven't even gotten to the main character. <laughs> Our main character is Paul Atreides, the son to the Duke Leto Atreides I mentioned before. He's 15 years old and has been trained from birth at combat, literature, politics, science, everything a young man needs in his life. No video games though. His mother, the Lady Jessica, is the Duke's love, but not legal wife. She has trained Paul in the ways of her secret order, the Bene Gesserit. The Bene Gesserit are a group of witches that serve the Emperor. They however have their own motivations and reasons for any choice they make and are trying to create this entity called the Kwisatz Haderach. They have been trained in combat, poisons, assassination, voice control, and have such a strong ability to control every cell in their body that they can manipulate their own genetics and stop blood flow, control every muscle, and even choose what gender they give birth to when pregnant. Jessica teaches a lot of their ways so that he can protect himself from anyone, especially as they are heading towards Arrakis as their new home. Paul even learns the way of the voice, and the way of the voice is the ability to control someone by pitching in at a certain frequency in the way you speak that you can control their actions. Give me a water. There are only women in the Bene Gesserit, and Paul seems to be the only male in any recent history that has the potential to learn their abilities. At the beginning of the book, Paul has already seen in his dreams of what lies ahead for him and his family on the sands of their new home. These visions appear to have merit to them as more and more events begin to unfold as he dreamt them in the story. This adds a layer of foreshadowing because there are events that don't even happen until the end of the book that are foreshadowed in the very first three chapters. The story from when they arrive is really the main bulk of the novel, where in which the world building and tension of danger around every corner multiplies together. The dangers at the beginning are mostly trying to figure out who your enemies are, how Arrakis works, and trying to make sure to see any dangers coming from House Harkonnen. Now with the world building, that's basically learning how the world works in our own way. And what better way to learn how the world works by trying to figure out what can kill you out there. When one thinks of sand, you probably also imagine a nice beach with a manageable temperature, palm trees for shade, and well, let's just say a drink in a hand and possibly a companion in another. Ugh. Arrakis, well, pretty much has none of that. And take that drink and turn it into a spiced coffee. Congratulations, welcome to Dune. The number one thing that will kill you when getting to Arrakis is the weather, the sun itself, literally the sand. Arrakis has no rainfall and no open bodies of water. The heat of the planet can kill a man in one day on the open desert without any water. Shade is virtually only possible near a rock formation and man-made still tents, which are very few. If the sun doesn't kill you, well congrats, the weather will try again, because there are storms on this planet, which roam the surface and have winds so strong that they can cut through metal and peel the skin from the bones of a human. Let's say there is no real flora either to help you sustain yourself if you're getting a bit hungry or a bit thirsty out there. Now you may be wondering, how the hell does anyone survive in this godforsaken place? And that is the fascinating thing about the world building as we learn about the natives and one of the things author Frank 
think Herbert tries to showcase through the story. Humans like to believe that we shape the world to our will. We build roads, we make paths where there were none, and we bend the earth to how we want it to be. But that is not so much the truth as much as we would like it to be. Nature and the worlds we inhabit really mold us to adapt to them. Here on planet Earth, we have adapted to all different kinds of biomes by adjusting ourselves to them. Now, the native tribes of Arrakis, known as the Fremen, are the epitome of this belief. They have adapted to the desert and instead of conquered, have lived with it. Through ingenuity and lifestyle changes, the Fremen created these things called still suits that allow them to survive the heat of the day and night. The suit is designed to capture the wearer's moisture that the body naturally secretes and repurpose it into clean drinking water so the body continues recycling and minimizing water loss when trekking the desert. There is even a mask that allows easier breathing and captures the moisture of breath, plus a nose filter to soak up any moisture lingering in the nostrils. Depending on the human body, 45 to 70% of our body is made up of water. So you can see why it is so valued to the Fremen on such a hostile planet. Now the Fremen are also known to be hostile to those who cannot learn their ways or keep up, so you may be rubbed of your water, let's say. They have a harsh life and so make harsh decisions in order to protect what matters to them. Fremen are also spice consumers and having prolonged exposure to the desert and spice that just fills the natural air are recognized by the blue eyes I mentioned earlier. They are called the eyes of Ibad and showcase how long someone has been living on Arrakis or pretty much how close they are to the natives. Now, besides weather and possibly hostile natives, there surely isn't much else out there that can kill you. Right? Well, unless you count the giant sandworms. The sandworms are the original fathers of Arrakis and have been here long before man. The worms are mythologized in the Fremen religion and are referred to as Shai Halut, or makers. They represent their deity and move amongst the desert consuming and swimming toward whatever makes noise in its habitat. The worms are iconic in their imagery to science fiction as showcased on the books themselves, in the movie adaptations, and in other sci-fi stories that take inspiration from Dune. The sizes that these makers of the desert are shown are monstrous. The worms are represented in the story like dragons from old medieval fables guarding treasure. That is the level of world building that is honestly just scratching the surface of Arrakis. And still there is more to learn about the universe and heaps more characters that are easily glazed over. And I didn't even get in terms of the terminology that's like here in the book written in the back, you know, like we've got the Walak 9, we've got the Amtal or the Amtal rule, uh, Arakeen, which is the capital, Barakar, the Bashar, you know, there's Drum Sand, the Door Seal, Dump Boxes, the Dune Men, the Dust Chasm, the Ekars, the Ego Likeness, the Alaka Drug, the LSIR, the, f oh, that's a hard one. The Fawfrelicious, the Fawf, the Fawfrelic, the Fawfrelicious, the Fawfrelay. Fidakin, but there is still so much more on Arrakis and off it that you can learn about while easily just consuming the movie recently in 2021, which I would argue is probably the best and easiest way to get into at least reading a book of this size. I won't spoil it, but I did say I wanted one half of this video to be introduction and the other to be my personal loves and takes. If you're happy to listen a bit more, I want to tell you the genre norm that old Frankie decided to point a stick at, and that is the idea of the chosen one. Going back to the Benny Gesserit, you know, those ninja space witches I mentioned. They want this thing called the Kwisatz Haderach. It's the one who points the way. Essentially, it is a messiah-like figure who will be able to perceive time in any capacity he chooses and lead the universe into a brighter tomorrow. It's a very vague description, but essentially it just means a male Benny Gesserit, which is something that Paul is suspected of being in the very start of the book. But we are not certain, and when pondered, Paul can't help but be unsure of this terrible meaning that it holds for him. Later, when arriving on Arrakis, Paul is suspected as being the Lisan al Gaib by some of the natives, as the ancient prophecy states that a man who has a Bene Gesserit mother will arrive onto their land and lead them to paradise. These two prophetic entities seem to have merit, and state the importance of Paul and who he may become. But what is incredible about Dune is that the plot shows a juxtaposition to this belief of a chosen one and says that people who are chosen were chosen by people like you or me and that power they gain does not give 
give them the fact of being morally correct all the time. It even takes us into the mind of characters to hear that in a monologue when tackling with their responsibilities, especially Paul, who knows his status as a Duke's son and the son of a Bene Gesserit. His actions not only have cause and effects, but they also spread like stories which add fuel to the flame of his name and popularity amongst the events of the novel. Now, I will end it here for the spoiler-free section of Dune, so go have fun if you want to go read it. But for you hardcore word readers and chads of the book out there, let me tell you the number one thing I loved about Dune, and that is Paul as a main character. Most often in sagas and epics, the main character to me can become boring and have typical reactions, plus not have a lot of internal conflict. But Paul, mate, he fucking knocks it out of the park here in terms of internal and external conflict. It is awesome how well it is shown. Paul just delivers as an engaging protagonist who not only changes throughout the story, but is actually disturbed and scared by change that is happening within him. He has a goal to achieve on many levels of trying to reclaim his throne over Arrakis and prevent the vision of the Holy War in his name. Essentially, it's a vision that he sees where he becomes so popular that fanatic legions go on a holy war across the universe, killing billions of people. I think this scene and when he sees it, shown in both the book and the movie, it is terrible terrifying and so well done, provoking the essence that Paul isn't sure what is happening to him, but he sees the veil of time ripped away from him. Having a character who also can see the future is something I despise in stories, but with Paul, it is represented as not just a linear cause and effect, but an abyss of branching paths which can be clouded by a nexus of uncertain conflict. In the sequel, prescience or future seeing is like looking afar at the desert and seeing what is ahead, but beyond the mountains is obscured because you're not close enough for that to manifest yet. The ability for Paul to foresee things also doesn't diminish the suspense of a great life or death situation because Paul's vision can be clouded by what's called a nexus of pathways. He knows at this junction are so many small decisions that could be made to alter his future and end his life here or continue it. Paul also must make sure that him seeing ahead of others does not make people revere and respect him even more, as this will send him closer to the holy war he witnesses. Paul and his conflict to make sure he doesn't fulfill this awful war in his name is one of the great things about his character, as he still retains his humanity, but much less of it for others to see. He is terrified of showing more affection or less of it, because he is worried that it will change people's opinion of him in a positive way. If people love him even more, then they'll revere him regardless and die on a sword for him. This ability also helps the plot structure of the book. Paul in the first bunch of chapters foreshadows future interactions with characters like Shani and the Baron when talking about his dreams. And you may not hear or see this specific scene he's talking about, but the context still makes sense way later in the books. For example, Paul is telling the Great Reverend Mother about one of his dreams, essentially talking about how he meets this girl on Arrakis and he knows he's going to meet her. She is asking him, Tell me of your homeworld or self. Paul says to the Great Reverend Mother that he doesn't understand what planet Ursul is. He's never heard of it. He was born on Caladan. Later in the story, when he becomes a part of the Fremen tribe, Paul is given the name Ursul. And that's when we realize that the girl was calling him Ursul. She wasn't referring to a planet. And it just is amazing how this all slowly ties together. Paul, as he is called and seen by others, is an amazing element of the story of Dune because it shows that the role of a messiah figure torments him as he knows those people that he respected and looked up to now idolize him and no longer see him as an equal, which is what he wanted. A symptom of stories we tell others of the powerful and how humanity wishes for them to be true. Like when I mentioned the Arrakis prophecy of the Lysan al Gaib. Well, turns out that was a Bene Gesserit ploy. When new planets are colonized, the Bene Gesserit send out one of their order to create false myths on these planets so that if they need for protection arises soon, or thousands of years later, the Bene Gesserit can then exploit this for safety or power. There is still so much more in terms of the complexity of Dune I have yet to talk about, and still so many more terms that I haven't discussed yet that all just slowly feed into each other. To wrap it up as a sci-fi story, Frankie Boy did something I was shocked to realize during his time of the 60s. This book was written in the 60s, and yet it reads like a modern science fiction novel. But the thing he does is that most sci-fi have a thing that makes them say, here is our unique MacGuffin device that makes this future a bit different from others. But Dune 
doesn't do that. It has no robots or artificial intelligence for reasons based on the lore of the novel. And it helps our characters because it shows how far humanity has come in not our technology, but our institutions, our beliefs, the things that we like to replicate and revive. We are at that point where we're worshiping technology so much, but in Dune, that has been obsolete because humanity values other things. Frank shows a universe so far in the future, but one that really shows who we are fundamentally as a society. I said it, I said, I said the thing as a society. I had to come out in a Dune video. But to cap it off, Dune is a sci-fi epic I've come to love and be really infatuated the more I learn about and experience. It has gotten me back into novels again, appreciate other tastes I love like Blade Runner, despite hating summer with a hotter passion than itself emits. I love Dune and I can say it is really worth getting into. And you know, boys, sometimes you gotta take a break from, you know, the pictures, the artwork as they say. You know what? That, fuck this. You know what? That's it. I'm gonna log Berserk. Berserk is out, boys. Getting rid of that. Getting rid of this. Yeah. No more, no more manga. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Dune reader now. I'm a, I'm a Dune guy. I, I like Dune. I'm a Dune man. Let's see. There we go. Gone. No more, no more manga. Only, only science fiction literature. Only science fiction literature. That's it. I'm just kidding. I really, I really want to, I love, I love this one. It's my favorite one. But tell me what you guys think. If you wanted to read Dune, you have read Dune, or if you read all of them and you couldn't get across from it, if you thought it was too complex for you, why? What was it about that turned you off? I'd actually love to hear. I'd really appreciate it. And if you want more videos on stories, which is what I love, Dune, Berserk, games, which are stories sometimes, then please subscribe. I'd appreciate it. But that's all from me, guys. It is fucking hot here in Australia. It is currently 34 degrees right now. I'm dying and sweating. The fan is going to die. My PC is going to burn out. So I'll leave it there. My name's Mugen. As always, have a good one.